Thank you very much. First, I want to tell you how really thrilled I am to be here. I, I do travel a lot, and I go to different schools in Europe and in this country, but I can tell you that it's a rare occasion when one can visit a school which has just a few people I have met, the incredible spirit, uh, g generosity of uh, uh, giving time, and I, I must say I'm, I'm really overwhelmed by the people who helped uh, this evening, this today, to put up uh, an exhibition of my drawings, and I'm just uh, telling you that it's marvelous to be here, so uh, thank you. Uh, I really uh, <clears throat> also want to say that it is a very unique opportunity for me to be able to uh, give a lecture or about my own work in conjunction with an exhibition uh, of the drawings. And in thinking about it, uh, I came to the conclusion then that I should really not show pictures of my work and describe it because it's here on view, and I'm certainly here to talk with anyone who's interested about it in the next few days. Uh, therefore, I, I thought it would be perhaps more proper for me to tell you a little bit about my own interests in architecture, how I view it, uh, what are the motives uh, behind my work, uh, and share with you some of, uh, uh, some of my thoughts, which perhaps will appear to you here in a uh, disorganized manner, but I try to present to, to the, them to you as coherently as I can within a short period of time. And I look forward to meeting you and speaking with you about it at greater length, if you're interested. One of the things that has uh, always fascinated me has been the writings of Flaubert, Gustave Flaubert, known primarily for Madame Bovary and so many other wonderful works. But uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with a little book which he meant to publish, but, well, it wasn't little. It was supposed to be very big, but it was never published. It remained in note form. And Flaubert had an idea, this is in the middle of 19th century, uh, to write an encyclopedia of human stupidity, sort of a very large project. Uh, and uh, he, it's, in translation, it's called the Dictionary of Accepted Ideas, but uh, it's really a marvelous, uh, it's, it's a marvelous uh, little book, and if you have an opportunity to read it, uh, please do. But, you know, it has uh, entries under, in a dictionary form uh, about everything, and uh, of course, as an architect, and someone who's interested in architecture, first thing that I did when I got this dictionary, I looked up architecture, and it was an interesting uh, definition because Flaubert says, architecture, there are but four architectural orders, styles. Of course, forgetting the Egyptian, Cyclopean, Assyrian, Hindu, Chinese, Gothic, Romanesque, and so forth. So it really startled me because it, it appeared that already in 19th century, people as brilliant as Flaubert were clearly aware that there was a problem in a stylistic approach to architecture, viewing architecture merely as a formalism of one sort or another. So keep this definition in mind as I develop my little talk. And then the other definition which I would like you to keep in mind is his uh, definition of an architect. Architects, in plural, all idiots, they always forget to put in the stairs. And that too, I think, you know, at first it appeared uh, extremely funny, but it, it is funny. But then I thought about it, what, what did Flaubert really mean by architects, all idiots? They all always forget to put in the stairs. And it occurred to me that really they do forget the stairs, to put the stairs. I don't mean the stairs that they can calculate and uh, look up in graphic standards, but the stairs which would connect their art, their task, with the overall meaning of, you can say life, for lack of a better word, truth. Uh, and uh, again, by 19th century, it was clear that architects were by, uh, in general, forgetting to put in the stairs. 
It was a, a new world which was coming into being and a world in which we are now having to cope with. So without uh, further ado, I'd like uh, to show you uh, these images and uh, I, I'm, I'll warn you that this is not a talk about sort of a few neat formulas, some dogmas, some uh, uh, so-called truths in architecture as I see them. No, it's, it's an uh, attempt on many levels to distill what, at least for me, are the issues in contemporary architecture because I do believe that uh, we are facing a crisis in architecture. And whether we admit it or not, uh, uh, there is a crisis and it is not on the stylistic level. It also seems to me, just as a preface, that architects as we have known them from the 19th century and on are really sitting on a melting iceberg. Uh, and if they don't really become aware of, of what is happening around them, they will disappear like the hippopotamus or some other animal has disappeared in history. And my talk today, I will try to formulate in these terms about the melting iceberg, about the architect sitting on its top, and about the logos or uh, continuity of this process in what we call history. Can I have the first two slides, please? There's a slide before this one. Was there not a slide before this one? On the left side. I'm sorry, I have, my slides are in thick mounts uh, from Europe and they don't fit into projector. That's it. But it's upside down. One of the themes of my uh, little talk today will be the theme of the siren. You know, the sirens are those mythical creatures who have their own history. And you perhaps recognize from this picture on the left, it's a, it comes from a vase fifth, about fifth century BC. It's the picture uh, illustrating a famous uh, chapter in the Odyssey, chapter 12 in which, as you will recall, uh, Ulysses ventures forth uh, across uh, the sea to the island or around the island of uh, the Sirens. And I'll just refresh your memory because I'm sure you know the story that the Sirens are enchantresses. They are enchanting nymph-like creatures, very beautiful. And they have voices which make them extremely appealing. Their song, their poetry enchants one. But beneath, when one would move towards them, they turn out to be really very vicious birds of prey and they eat up whoever is foolish enough to be enchanted by them. But Ulysses is a very clever fellow, cunning, and uh, you'll recall he has a very good technique of overcoming the problem and solving the riddle of the sirens. And his solution is the following. He asks his sailors to stuff their ears with wax so that they would not hear these enchanting songs and would be able to row the boat properly. Himself, he asks to be lashed to the mast of the ship without the earwax, so he could hear the songs, but would remain immune to the consequences of the sirens. In other words, the more he would be tempted to go towards them, the more tightly would the bonds be circled around him. And in this particular episode, 
it has a good ending for Odysseus. The sailors row the boat. Odysseus hears the incredible song of the sirens. And at the same time, the sirens die. See, in this picture, they are shown diving headfirst into the water. Because once their mystery has been solved, they commit suicide. It's very similar to, to the riddle of the Sphinx, as you know. Uh, the Sphinx, too, uh, when the riddle of the Sphinx was solved, threw herself into the precipice and died. But I don't tell this uh, fable really uh, as a story for children. I think, in, in, in essence, it contains the entire problematic of what it means to be enlightened, to hear the song. It also talks about uh, the consequences of enlightenment, uh, the repression, the self-mutilation, which is the condition for it. And it also talks about the relationship between theory and practice. It talks about those who one has to rely on to do the work in order for someone to be able to hear the song of the sirens and at the same time turn them into unconscious laborers in the process. So the myth really is a myth of uh, liberation and enslavement at the same time, a myth about temptation of knowledge and repression of knowledge, domination by the muses and domination by men. I just ask you to keep it in mind because my talk today is about the sirens and on the left, it's a very famous iconographical picture from an encyclopedia of imagery which came out around 1600, Cesare Ripa, in which he illustrates all the things that one should know. And under architecture, like Flaubert, he enters uh, his definition. And his definition is that architecture is personified by a fully grown woman. She is uh, showing a plan of a military encampment, there are two uh, children, Putti, playing at her feet and scribbling various facts about Corinthian and sort of capitals. And she's standing next to a fragment of classical architecture, now in dis disuse. And behind her is Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. And still behind her is Semiramis, the protectress of Babylon. And there is in the background of the picture, construction of the city of Babylon. And the two little epigrams say the following. Semiramis, who is personification of architecture, constructed Babylon, city of the Persians, commanded in war and was always strong. Semiramis in the field of Mars was skilled and also could a world wonder build. And I think if we follow these personifications throughout, and I'll have many others as they evolve historically, we will remember something about where the problem has come from and where it is going, perhaps. Next, please. So in Ulysses, the problem was how to hear the song and at the same time to remain alive. That's the wrong slide. It's the wrong series. So somewhere in the middle, the one on the right. There should be another slide there of... No. You've got the back package, I think. No. 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 Shall I come over? Yeah. You pardon me. 
I really apologize. I don't know how all these slides have gotten totally out of this order, but I guess it's uh, appropriate that uh, one would think of Flaubert's own definition and think that anybody who's trying to, to talk about ideas with slides is slightly mad. <laughs> Nevertheless, if, if I have your patience and you're still here, uh, I'll try to muddle through and, and uh, somehow continue if you remember what I have been speaking about. Can I have the next few slides, please? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. That's correct. See, despite the appearances, these slides are actually very precisely chosen to illustrate certain phenomena, which if not on the intellectual level, at least on the visual level, are self-evident. But uh, the picture of the, on the left is actually taken from Mircea Eliade's treatise on yoga, and it's a uh, sort of a, a, a illustration of one of the mystical trances. Um, which has as its ethic something like, though he may slay me, yet I will trust him. And in this particular mystical sect, uh, the person lies buried in a sack for as long as he can take it. On the other side is a very famous photograph of Mies van der Rohe at IIT. And I guess I'm trying to talk a little bit here about the notion of immortality in architecture, the notion at which point uh, belief becomes a mystical trance. But in any case, for practical purposes, the two are pretty much the same, or the results of the two are pretty much the same. Uh, and I'd like to quote to you, and I have a few things to quote because they are much more precise than what I can say in a few words, from uh, George Orwell, Orwell, a very beautiful essay he wrote. Uh, and I think it's very appropriate because I, I consider Orwell probably the, one of the leading intellectuals in the Western world throughout uh, sort of all the nonsense that was taking place in England around him, from Marxism to positivism. He kept his head level and looked at, re at reality as something perplexing and at the same time meaningful. But this is what George Orwell says. He says, it is perhaps worth noting that everyone, at least everyone in the English speaking world, inevitably speaks of Jonah and the whale. Of course, the creature that swallowed Jonah was a fish and is so described in the Bible, Jonah 1.17. But children naturally confuse it with a whale. And this fragment of baby talk is habitually carried on into later life, a sign, perhaps, of the hold that the Jonah myth has upon our imagination. For the fact is that being inside a whale is very comfortable, cozy, home-like thought. The historical Jonah, if he can be so called, was glad enough to escape. But in imagination, in daydream, countless people have envied him. It is, of course, quite obvious why. The whale's belly is simply a womb big enough for an adult. There you are in the dark, cushioned space that exactly fits you with yards of blubber between yourself and reality able to keep up an attitude of the completest indifference, no matter what happens. A storm that would sink all the battleships in the world would hardly reach you, even as an echo. Even the whale's own movements would probably be, probably be imperceptible to you. He might be wallowing among the surface waves or shooting down into the blackness of the middle seas, but you would never notice the difference. Short of being dead, it is the final, unsurpassable stage of irresponsibility. Next, please. <laughs> a 
upside down. See, I, I think that uh, what Olmo was saying uh, in connection to literature, no doubt uh, has uh, relevance to architecture as it is practiced today. Because all that can be said, or all uh, I think that uh, what is most characteristics, characteristic of architecture today, is that uh, the ideas in it are really seen from the angle of Jonah. A willing Jonah, not a resisting Jonah as the one in the Bible. Not that uh, this Jonah is especially introverted. Quite on the contrary, in our case, the whale happens to be transparent. And I think this contemporary Jonah feels no impulse to alter, alter or control the process that he's undergoing. He has performed what Orwell calls the essential Jonah act of allowing himself to be swallowed remaining passive, accepting. So I came upon this picture on the right in a, a recent magazine and I took it and it, I thought it was an important picture. Not because so much about the content of it, the actual project, but it reminded me so much of Dürer's uh, melancho melanc Melancholia. You perhaps know that uh, this engraving of Dürer is one of the most mysterious uh, in all of Dürer's oeuvre. It's made about 1530. And uh, it is one, of, uh, in, uh, historians and uh, experts in, in art of the period are themselves baffled as to what Dürer had in mind. But there is no doubt that uh, they agree on the fact that Melancholia, in this case Melancholy II, as you see on the top, is a personification of architecture, just like the contemporary image of our time is also a embodiment of architecture. But there is an interesting difference in, in the two images, even though they are analogous. On the left, architecture sits as a, again, a grown woman, but now slightly pensive, melancholy, no longer like in Ripa's picture of architecture, that strong woman with a manly arm. This one is by now dejected. Dejected at the consequences of the task of architecture and around the melancholia. And by the way, this picture is drawn at night. What you see is not a rainbow, it's a lunar, lunar light. There is a bat flying. It's a fantastic uh, picture to go into. Uh, her wings are down, and among her are all the tools of the trade of the architect, and the, all the tools of carpentry and making of buildings, from nails to ink to all these utensils, now lying uselessly on the ground. And then uh, there is that sick dog, also lying at her feet. And she's sitting behind her is a building, clearly incomplete building with a ladder. There's a magic square, obviously referring to the influence of Jupiter as a counteract to melancholy Saturn. There is the hourglass running, the balance, perfectly balanced. And in the middle is personification of practice of architecture. You see, Actually, architectura here, in Dürer's case, is the thought of architecture, what he calls theoria, the view of architecture. And the infant there, unaware of the cataclysm that has occurred, is scribbling still something on his little board, as if reality was going normally. And then there are two incredible forms, the pure sphere and this hexa hexagonal rhomboid form, which are clearly a very prominent feature of her, of her misery. Now, when we move to the contemporary image of success, we also move to the willing Jonah, and I'll continue with Orwell, because 
I think Orwell is saying that both progress and reaction have turned to be swindles. You see, the passive attitude will come back, as he says, will come back after all the passive attitudes from history have eroded themselves. And he says, it will be more consciously passive than ever before. Seemingly today, and he's writing in 1940, there is nothing left but quietism, robbing reality of its terrors by simply submitting to them. And I think that's the difference between these two images. One on the left, the terror is not submitted to, su not submitted to, it is contemplated and its consequences are clearly postulated. I think on the right, our own situation, it is simply true that we have to get inside the whale, or rather admit that we are already inside the whale, because we are, of course. And as Orwell says, give yourself over to the world process, stop fighting against it, pretending that you can control it, simply accept it, endure it, record it. That seems to be the formula that any sensitive architect of our time would follow, and so does the one on the right. But I think we must ask ourselves that in the process in which we are accepting and, so to speak, swallowing the reality as a whole, at the same time as being swallowed by it, what, are we re what is really happening to us? What are the tacit acceptances that go with it? Clearly, the architect is not merely accepting the hexagonal rhomboid shapes on top of his buildings. He's not merely accepting the obelisks, he's accepting the entire system of thought and consciousness, or lack of it, which underlies them. Next, please. So if you will, I continue with uh, Albrecht Dürer on the left, his study of perspective, his study of art as a scientific procedure. He was also an architect. He studied architecture as a scientific procedure. And I show it to you as a memory of Odysseus or Ulysses and the sirens. Really, we are now watching the same dilemma, the power of knowledge and the experience of alienation at the same time. The beautiful woman, again from Ripa, Architectura, Melancholia, lying there behind the screen. And there is the artist, the architect, Dürer himself, bound to look at one point with one eye, cl one eye closed and mapping out the system of logical reality. The access into nature is also an ingress, sorry, the access into nature is also an exit of the soul, so to speak. And the one uh, that Albrecht Dürer is drawing is still, of course, in the line of art imitating nature. So it's still, the sirens are there, although they're dying, they're lying down, they're about to disappear into the water. On the right is the opposite phenomena, slightly later, where art no longer imitates nature, but rather nature from now on is imitating art. A sort of trans transformation or inversion has occurred here in history. And I graph it for you by a beautiful illustration from André, the French uh, doctor, who used this illustration as a preface to a book on orthopedics, where, whose full title is Orthopedics, or the signs of preventing deformity in small children. So it's about you know, how to prevent deformities, how to overcome deformities in small children. And it's a fascinating image, which by the way, Foucault uses in his book, Discipline and Punish. It's about discipline and about punishment, about the price that the sailors had to pay for the experience of Ulysses. Next, please.
and I'm skipping tremendously from 18th century. On the left is a treatise in architecture by Friart de Chambray around 1702, 1700. And on the right is a treatise on architecture from our time. The one on the left illustrates the unity of the muses, architecture, painting, and sculpture, the three graces sitting up in the clouds, still a little bit of the broken of column remains, brushes, the tools of the trade are around, but the whole thing is rather crude, simplified, and we already have the portent of what is to come. And what is to come is Kobo Abe, the Japanese novelist, whose books I recommend highly. This book is entitled The Box Man, and it starts like this, instructions for making a box, and it tells you what you need today to live. What you need today to live. Because I'm not really speaking about the low form of living, sort of keeping your head from being wet, but living in depth. And Kobo Abe believes that all you need is an empty box, that all you need is a vinyl sheet and a pair of scissors and a bit of scotch tape. Next, please. But we shouldn't really be in shock about Kobo Abe, that it is a treatise on architecture written by a philosopher or a writer, because it has been in preparation, so to speak, for a long time. And I'm trying today in some coherent form to present to you the evidence of the process as we have found it. The theater of automatons, which became a rage in the 18th century courts, where automatic performers were installed very often to no one's view, was at the same time seen in the context of discipline and enlightenment, education. So to speak, no risk education. And the 18th century was very good at installing the propaganda for no risk education. It did not only come through the writers of the Enlightenment, but it was put in practice by the theorists of behavior like Bentham and others. And the picture on the right is a lecture, lecture about the evils of alcoholism to alcoholics. And I will come back to what I mean by no risk education, because just as an aside, I would say that the adventure, the unknown in architecture has evaporated. Since architecture has become a profession, and it is only a very short time that it has been a profession, and as I said, it is already melting away. But in any case, since it has become a profession, it has ceased to be an endeavor of a spiritual sort it has be begun to attract a very different audience and a very different character type to it. Just an aside comment, and think or remember this illustration when I show you the same picture, but without the walls, without the explicit bondage, which in the 18th century was still very much visible and therefore seen consciously. I would say that the problem is, like in the theater of automatons, the disappearance of the hierarchy or the disappearance of the bondage from our consciousness, and as Orwell says, the acceptance of it. Next, please. And I'm trying also to trace for you, in a very sporadic form, where it came from, at what point the transition happened in which this foolishness took over. Because uh, uh, 1600, this is an illustration from uh, Jacob Bond's famous Historia Naturalis, in which he illustrates all the animals. It's one of the first histories of animals, encyclopedia of facts. And when it comes to the orangutan, Jacob Bond, 1600, says, this is an orangutan. He says, I've never seen one, but I know he is like we are. He looks a little bit like we because I read it in Pliny, 
and Pliny says that they are sort of satyrs who have human emotions. So within a scientific tradition, one had the real insight or the, you, see, you can say, closeness of association between uh, you can say the human type and the surrounding world. And it, of course, exists up to the end of the Renaissance. 1535, on the right, Parmigianino, the painter, drawing a self-portrait of himself. And I have looked at this drawing many times and wondered what is really behind it? How does he see himself? It's a very peculiar image, as if he was aware already, even prior to Jacob Bond's treatise, what kind of history is going to be written. And the separation clearly comes way before Rousseau subordinates the world to himself. Next, please. This, too, is a close transition of the problem. Like in Jacob Bond's picture of the orangutan, we have another treatise on, on animals called The History of the Four-Footed Beasts, written in England by Edward Tapsell, just around Shakespeare's time, in which he lists all the animals that exist in the world. And he inserts this portrait of Lamia, Lamia, a sphinx, a type of siren who hides in the, wood with her, with, in the woods with her beautiful face and chants tired travelers by exposing her breasts and then devours them silently in the darkness. So this is what appeared in the history of the four-footed beast. But by the time of Ribera in Spain and in other places in Europe, around 1630, 1640, 1650, we have already sensing that this is another problem. Ribera paints the bearded woman who really is not a creature of fable or imagination, but is a actual specimen found in his town. And he presents this portrait to the king with all its veracity verified uh, in the title, uh, which was uh, appended to, to the painting itself, that he really saw it with his own two eyes. And one must ask oneself the question, at what point did it have to be really verified like this. Next, please. My talk moves in little circles, and the circles get a little bit bigger, and sometimes cover territories which don't seem to be connected with architecture, but I assure you they are. Uh, I'm now going a little bit through the medical uh, history, and I ask myself this question, at what point did the body become an object? For the Greeks, as you know, soma, or how we translate body, was only used for the corpse. They never had a word for a living body. They had words for different parts which were alive, but they never had a word for the whole, because the whole was seen only in death. And in 13th, 12th, 11th century, in the medieval times, they were illustrating the study of the body like this. It's a very interesting uh, piece of knowledge that the professor, the doctor, who was lecturing on the body, sat upstairs on his cathedra, sat upstairs on his professorial chair, and explained what was happening. But he did not perform the actual dissection. This comes from a 12th century medical textbook. And it illustrates the barber, the barber surgeon standing down there, cutting up the corpse, and the slight interest on the part of the students who are midway now between the professor and the experience. The education is becoming riskier. And on the right is the frontispiece to uh, Vesalius, the so-called first modern treatise in anatomy. And it is very modern indeed. 
as you can see by this introduction, it's about 1540, about the time that Palladio was building his anatomical buildings in Vicenza and in, around the Veneto. And I think there is something of this attitude already in Palladio. We, we, don't, we should not just see him as a pristine classicizing architect. We should see that he's engaged in a very similar task as Vesalius. Because what Vesalius has done is he has stepped down from the professorial lectern. He's no longer observing and discussing the subject matter. He is involved. He is engaged. He is in the middle of the theater and he's mobbed by the unbelievable curiosity of the students. And if you have time, I would recommend looking at this plate uh, for a long time because you will see how incredibly drawn it is. Every face is contorted with expression of disbelief and interest. It's the sort of interest that was absolutely repellent in the past. I'll read you a little thing from St. Augustine, from his uh, book on what he called the true relig religion. And this is what St. Augustine says. And I've remembered this for a long time because it's a very curious piece of uh, writing, which is very interesting. He says, in the study of the creature, one should not exercise a vain and perishing curiosity, but ascend to toward what is immortal and everlasting. And this was indeed the creed illustrated on the left. The warning not to be too curious, not to go too far, not to get too involved, but to deal with what is imperishable, what is inorganic, you can say, what is non-visceral, what is non-whale-like. Next, please. two significant uh, pieces of theory of philosophy and science. On the left is that earth-shaking experiment of Galileo about acceleration, which is perhaps the first truly modern proof in science. It's the, it's the beginning of a new method in science. And I will read you what uh, Galileo says about it. And on the right is a picture from Descartes a book called A Treatise on Passion, The Treatise on Passions. So this comes from a treatise on passions, not from some scientific textbook. And the one by Galileo goes like this. He says, this is from uh, the mathematical discourses around 1638, and Descartes is approximately at the same time, first third of the 17th century. Galileo says, the present, in describing this experiment, does not seem to be the proper time to investigate the cause of the acceleration of natural motion, concerning which various opinions have been expressed by various philosophers, some explaining it by attraction to the center, others by repulsion between small parts of the body, others attributed to certain stress in the surrounding medium, da 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 da. Now, all these fantasies, and others too, ought to be examined, but for me it is not really worthwhile. At present it is my purpose, or it is the present purpose of our author, merely to investigate and to demonstrate some properties of accelerated motion and not its cause. It's a very uh, loaded piece of theoretical writing because there is a switch here, a very conscious and deliberate switch. Galileo is the first one to say he's not interested in the ontology, in the causality, in the foundation of the problem of motion. He's merely interested in describing it by a method which is, can be reasoned out. And he says, I will get to the causality of it at some other point if I can, but nevertheless, I can describe it perfectly well as I am now. So he takes the pendulum uh, experiment, right? There's the swinging of the pendulum from D to C. 
and he inscribes it in a circle, and he draws the radii in which it falls back to the same line. He draws the inclines of the plane, which are parts of the segments of the circle, and so on. You know what happened after that. But what I'm really illustrating is we, we have moved in this particular experiment, and it's the key experiment, because it's an experiment which is imaginary in nature, from meaning of the experience of motion to the technique of motion, from the being of motion to the method in which motion can be grasped. And it is the same method that Descartes will use when it comes to describing the human being. For him, as you know, the human being is merely a mechanism. He, a human being is an engine, is a hydraulic uh, operation with valves and uh, equipment into which a soul has been inserted as an external and alien entity. So the separation between what he calls the body and the soul in order to mechanize and be able to describe reality objectively is here illustrated in both cases as a critical point for architects too. Next, please. We have indeed moved from, in, in Descartes, and specifically in Galileo, from simply geometry used as a, as a tool to the algebraization of the geometry. In fact, to a mathematization of the entire world picture, world that can now be grasped simply in the language of mathematics. And you will recall that Galileo said, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. It is not written in the language of the sirens, it is not written in the language of Jonah. It is not written in a human language. It is written in a code which, whose access itself is opaque. Now, if you permit me, I proceed with a sort of story because I am really telling you a story. It's a narrative, a legend. Vesalius illustrates his skeletons and his beings like this. It's not just bones, it's not just objects, it's not yet Descartes, it's about a hundred years earlier. It's the skeleton contemplating his own demise, if you will. It's the immensity of the world aware of the absence of meaning of the world. It's like Yorick in Hamlet holding the skull, the same sensibility is displayed here, as it is displayed in Père Lachaise and the countless uh, outgrowths of the anatomy lesson in architecture. See, I think that 19th century was the most interesting century in architecture because everything happened in it. Everything came to the fore. What happened in medicine earlier, what happened in science earlier, was actually built into architecture by the 19th century. And if you will, if you permit, it is architecture contemplating its own absence. It is the skeleton of reality with a memory of reality as a disembodied and disengaged anatomy. Next, please. Disembodiment. You see, I'm really talking about disembodiment of architecture, not just of the architect. It has been said that if there is one common denominator in architecture today, is that it all follows the laws of gravity. It's the one condition to which we can reduce it. It all stands up that way, the way Galileo wanted it to stand up. But the consequences were clear to those who were engaged in formulating the language of this particular ideology. And in 17th century and earlier, of course, after Reformation, we have chapels, like this Capuchin Chapel in Rome, built throughout Europe after the wars, which claimed so many lives. And they are built as the reliquaries, as mortuary chapels, and also as warnings to the future. They are not merely grotesque, at first repulsive things one should not deal with, but one should study them in the same way one would study Jonathan Huybert, the Dutch doctor, 
famous one of 18th century. We have moved about 150 years from Vesalius on the right, and that's the frontispiece to Huybert's anatomy book. You see, he doesn't illustrate it by the curious onlookers crowding the doctor to find out what is being dissected and what has really happened. He illustrates, illustrates it simply as a group of organs lying in front of him. You see, the actual architecture is just the viscera. We've got lungs and livers and kidneys. All this stuff is just lying, waiting to be explored. And there are these three skeletons, children's skeletons, apparently like the Vesalius skeletons, still having misgivings about the process. They're wiping their tears with membranes and clutching at nerve systems. Next, please. I am going back in circles, not forward. I'm not illustrating some cubist painting or cubist images. These are both images from about the same time, 1530, Italy. The one on the left is a drawing by Karachi, one of the Karachi brothers, Anibali Karachi. Portrait. And it is striking how liquefied the anatomy has become, the entire oval format of this uh, drawing is so reminiscent of what was to be happening in 1905 and 1907. And on the right, we have an uh, illustration from Bracelli, the Florentine architect, artist, illustrating the architect. Architect as a Cartesian fabricator architect as a machine f repeating in his own experience his own fabrication as a machine. So there is the architect who is already equipment, making more equipment through equipment. The same process that Karachi, by the way, is using technically because in a way it's not just a portrait of a face, it is a test case of technique. Next, please. Another architecture study, book, textbook by Abraham Boss, 1650s, French Academy, the courtiers, voyeurs of architecture. See, they're voyeurs of ABCD. Like all those anatomical treatises, there is a tremendous depiction here because such a split occurs. They are dressed up to the hilt, literally wonderful clothing, the, the whole court etiquette, the elegant stance, the hat under the arm. But what they are viewing is not in this world. What they are viewing is Euclidean beginnings of architecture. What they are viewing is proposition and axioms in the form of ABCD. Not only are they viewing it by this time, but they're also building it. On the right, from a book called Deutschland, Deutschland über alles, by Kurt Tucholsky, who committed suicide when Hitler took power in Berlin. He was an artist, writer, journalist. And he did this picture, sort of a follow-up to the Freyart prison for alcoholics. This time it was a school. A certain curious redundancy here is taking place because the figures inscribed on the back of these matrons who are being reformed are being shown to them on their front without them being aware that it has already happened, so to speak, on their back. It's like a Kafka story of metamorphosis. You remember the message in Kafka in the transformation is that the message is written on the back, but this time by Kafka in an explicit manner. See, it's written on the back, but it's engraved in a very painful manner. So we have here consequences, as if one was analyzing the viscera of the enlightenment, the viscera of the paradox 
of Ulysses and the Sirens. Next, please. That's correct. Los Caprichos by Goya. We're entering the 19th century and some people are not entering it in the same step as others. Goya was not entering it like the Victorian optimists, the Victorian inventors. He didn't only have a premonition of what was going to happen, he actually had the bad dream all at once. The dream of reason produces monsters. That's what he says, and then he goes on to draw all the monsters of reason. And on the right is the monster of reason. It looks harmless enough, and that's why it is such a monster. It's a first morgue, mechanized morgue in Paris, circa 1870. A wonderful, wonderful new invention. A dream come true, we can say. Next, please. There should have been two other slides before these two. Are there not? Well, don't worry about them. I tell you what they were. There were two slides from the carchery of Piranesi. Do you know the prisons series of Piranesi? So you have to imagine it. They are, after all, also dreams. So it's perfectly all right to imagine them. And if you permit me, I would like to read you because Piranesi was like a prophet, at least to me, of, of the developments in Europe and architecture. And I would like to read you a passage, not by Piranesi, not from one of his treatises, but uh, from the dreamer in literature, from Thomas de Quincey, friend of Wordsworth and Coleridge. And you know that uh, around 1800, 1820, 1830, the dream began to appear as a very interesting phenomena everywhere. Not only the dream, but together with the dream, everything which was alien, everything which was foreign, everything which was exotic. See, the two phenomena went together. The discovery of the internal alienness, the internal disembodiment, the internal objectification, and on the other hand, the longing for foreignness outside, the discoveries of Africa, of the Orient, the travels, the fascination with myth and the obsession with history. These are two aspects of one phenomena which one day we may see that they actually correspond. But let me go to one of these dreamers and the dreamers were always on two levels. Some of them were opium eaters, hashish eaters, dropouts, and others were the intellectuals. They were also dreamers. Baudelaire, he wrote his book on hashish, said, or on opium, he said, there are two ways to get out of this world. Only two. One way is to take opium. The other way is to read Social Contract by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. <laughs> and he said, if you can't read Rousseau, just take opium. But if you, if, if you can, try not to take the opium, try to read Rousseau, it has the same effect. <laughs> well, I don't mean it in a jest, I will just verify it by the Quincy confession of an opium eater. He says, many years ago, when I was looking over Piranesi's Antiquities of Rome, Mr. Coleridge, the poet, who was standing by, described to me a set of plates by the artist called his dreams and which recur record the scenery of his own visions during the delirium of a fever. So clearly Coleridge told him, don't worry, it's really the delirium of a fever that Piranesi is showing you here. And it's a dream. 
In fact, it's curious that Coleridge remembers it as a des uh, describing dreams because Piranesi calls it prisons. See, there's a big difference between a prison and a dream. The, 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 prison which, uh, the dream which has become prison is clearly a nightmare. Well, De Quincey goes on, some of them, these plates, I describe only for memory of Mr. Coleridge's account, represented, it's interesting that some of the Cubists referred to liquefaction in their painting to the fact that they were interested in water and in crystals and in transparency. They were using a very similar experience but pushing it to a limit. And I think I would raise here the question, the question which preoccupies me, whether what we call modern art is something new. I think if one reads Gideon and all the uh, early writers on modern architecture, modern art, Kahnweiler, everyone, they always say how new modern art is. It comes sort of from Athena's head around 1890 and it opens up a new world of possibilities. But I have often wondered whether modern art is really new at all. Whether in fact what we call modern art is not a development of apocalyptic sort th of the same tradition which I'm now describing. Whether in fact that so-called non-figurative and abstract nature of contemporary architecture and being is not in fact a winding up of a malady rather than a beginning of a new case. On the left is a painter who lived not so far from Picasso in the same milieu slightly earlier, a painter in Paris called Bilek, who was a Czech painter, but here are his drawings and they are like uh, the drawings of Gaudi and the buildings of Gaudi. Uh, they are really showing the problem in a particular context, they're showing the pilgrims of the shipwreck coming, arriving with their boat. They are showing the trees, the architectural orders, taking on a figurative meaning within an abstract uh, skull. And they are showing the longing, the hand, the transparent nostalgia, you can say, for the lost cause. And it's the two strangers. You can say it's like Ulysses or like Mr. Bloom even better. Next, please. Well, we are out of synchronization, but I'm here on the right was illustrating the Gaudi approach, which is not uh, different from Bilek, and it's not really different from Picasso. It's only that in Picasso we have a further transformation so that we don't see that the hands are joining up above. We don't see the figures coming out of the trees. We only see the so to speak, the interstices, interstices or ligaments of the figures. Can you go on, on just on the right, please? That's right. That drawing by Bilek, like Sagrada Familia, by Gaudi is an attempt at what they called a place of reconciliation and harmony. And so are these two images, attempts at reconciliation and harmony of the problem that we have found. And to me they are very similar. They are not often shown together so we forget what lies behind them but I think they are in essence testaments to the same truth because the Saint Genevieve library built by La Brust in Paris is very much the doubling up of architecture upon itself. You know, it has a liquid-like interior. It has a cubist interior. It has an aquarium inside. If you've been inside, it's like an aquarium for readers of books. It's all modern inside. It's all a glass palace. But on the outside, La Brousse could not solve the problem. He could not let himself go. His malady was not yet wound up. And he gave the St. Genevieve Library the appearance of a monumental, classical, ancient legitimation. It's like Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Half the time, La Brousse was an architect. The other half the time, he was an engineer. Part of him longed for the hand coming through the trees turned into figures. Part of him was the fabricator fabricating himself. And he couldn't resolve the problem so clearly. You see, we find it like a double-edged problem. Part of the time it's Dr. Jekyll, 
and part is Mr. Hyde. On the outside, it looks like the old stuff in Paris, but on the inside, it's a big shock. Like in Goya, the separation between the violence and the tormenting of the figure, which retain their organic, if distorted form, now separated from the equipment of violence in the form of the artist's tools. In the disasters of war, Goya always paints the guns as a set of parallel lines constructed geometrically, which are always separated and juxtaposed against the figures tormented in the middle. And he calls it the disaster of war. He was talking about the Revolutionary War, but I'm also talking here in Labrouste's case of a sort of illustrations of a disaster of war, not as externalized as the one in the Goya's case. Next, please. Therefore, too, we are talking about duplicity. If we talk about doubling up on itself, we talk about duplicity. We talk about the double, the lie, the fact that the progressive and the reactionary are both forms of swindle and deceit. And there is a progressive reactionary, I would call him, Durand, one of my favorite uh, writers of treatises, who distilled architecture into a catalog of what he called catalog of types. Very popular today, I know, in some countries and some schools. You, uh, all you have to do is uh, reduce architecture to what he thought was its essence. And it was a pity that he already lost the half of Dr. Jekyll that Labrust had, because he only went to the Ecole Polytechnique. You know, in France, the schools were very split during the Napoleonic the revolutionary times. There was the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, which thought that architects were artists and should wear berets and study ruins. And then there was the Napoleonic Ecole, the, uh, the, the Polytechnic School, in which architects were meant to be an army which would support the agglomeration of an empire. The military connotation, which is there in the very personification of architecture of Babylon, remember in the beginning, persists throughout all of these phases. But the duplicity persists as well. And on the right, well, it could be, have been taken anywhere, but I thought I would illustrate it from also a progressive reaction of sorts, from the National Socialist point of view. And it's a uh, series of uh, stations, uh, gasoline stations of the, on the main highways of Germany proposed in 1940 and built. So the so-called problem of ideology in architecture, the vernacular has come back but in a particular form, just the way it came back in all the forms of duplicity illustrated through other media. So we have, like Mr. Durand, a catalog of types which can now be used and manipulated for many purposes, not only for the architect's own purpose, but for the political purpose in which he is clearly engaged. Next, please. Nineteenth century Paris, haunted, haunted by the knowledge, or you can say by the absence of meaning. And if I would were to generalize, I'm really talking about the change from the architecture of presence to an architecture of absence, like the poetics of presence in Homer to the poetics of absence in Bloom and you and Joyce and like the poetics of absence here illustrated from the point of view of two artists. One is Charles Mayron, who in 1860 drew this picture. He was an engraver who worked on the site, drew buildings in Paris, but he couldn't help himself when he drew this ministry of, the, uh, of uh, marine, uh, naval ministry in Paris. The drawing is very realistic. The building is still there, but I've always wondered why he put those demons, Poseidons and nymphs and tritons, like the vocabulary of our missile age, in the sky, coming down from some notebook of Goya. How could he, you know, how could he get away with it? It was clearly something that appeared inevitably as inevitably as the absence of any figure appeared in uh, the photographs of Adjay. Adjay, who was discovered uh, by the surrealists in the 20s, was a photographer who photographed Paris 
former actor who took up photography because he loved to photograph Paris without people. He photographed shop windows, courtyards, parks. But he photographed it in such a baffling manner because there are no figures. You know, he would photograph Champs-Élysées without anyone there. He would photograph Place de la Concorde without a single figure moving. He was a master, master of absence. And it's fantastic, his vision of, of the city. It's one step closer to ours. Next, please. A vision. Both of these are visions of the process. Because I'm talking about a process which is not finished. As long as we are alive, it's an unpredictable process, and one shouldn't be too certain where it's going. But there are two visions of the process, separated perhaps by a long time, more than a century. The one on the right you probably recognize as a Magritte vision of architecture. The eulogy to the dialectic, the dialectic of architecture, architecture seen through itself, into itself, as a form of unreality. It's a very perplexing painting because one doesn't know quite what one is supposed to see. Is one looking through a real building at another real building? Is one looking through a vista which is totally unreal at something real? Are both of them unreal? which give us another real, and anyway, where are they? What sector of reality, what dimension of reality do they occupy? It is the same as the drawing of William Blake, who drew this, uh, William Blake, the poet, who wrote all his prophecies, you know, he wrote the prophecy of America, and wrote, or he was a sort of a madman, demon, some autobiographical facet here. It's very curious. It has this cage-like quality, like that Père Lachaise cemetery slide I showed you of the skeleton contemplating his own demise. The vision is here. Next, please. And if, if you permit me, I'd like to summarize a little bit of what I was saying. The one on the left is a typical picture of the time, so the old time, let's call it, the time when the chain really meant something. You see, there is the personification of nature. There is, if you will, a form, a feminine form of Ulysses, chained, but the chain here is not seen in a, as a shackle. It's seen as a good chain, the chain of being, they called it. There are the hierarchies of the spheres. From the center, in concentric circles, moves the meaning of the world. And the center of the meaning is the worst place to be. See, the center is not the best place to be. The center is the monkey, symbolizing wisdom, symbolizing the coldest and most decrepit part of the universe, the one in which all the excrescence of the universe, so to speak, has coagulated. And then as you go away to the skies, to the planets, to the orbs, and finally to the celestial fire, which bring, burns on the periphery, you reach through the chain of being that wonderful light, the light of total hierarchy, of total subordination, of total dependency. That's sort of the old story. Now here is the new story. It's from a handbook for girls to study Descartes, 17th century, 18th century, early 18th century, because all well brought up uh, young ladies were meant to know cosmology, but it was hard for them to know it because the cosmology changed dramatically. Still, they had to draw the su uh, somehow the solar system and the earth somewhere in the middle of this diagram, but as you can see, this Cartesian world is homogeneous. It's made up of atoms and molecules that fill up space completely, but they don't fill it up with these orbs of hierarchy. 
they don't fill up with this gradation of meaning. They fill it up with redundant elements, each really no better than the other. For Descartes, there are only three elements, like earth, water, and fire. And he represents them. You know, the earth is the bigger molecules, uh, then the water and air, sorry, there's four elements, the water and air are the smaller in between the molecules. And then when he says, you get a little bit of space left over in between all these elements, there's fire burning. And the fire is right where those circles come together. So in, you know, you've, you've got to squeeze elements into the world because it's so empty now that you've removed the hierarchy, but you still want to have continuity. So you've got continuity in Descartes. The, f the space is really, really full. It's so full that there cannot be any action at a distance. You know, Descartes thought that there could not be anything like attraction across a vacuum. Everything had to be transmitted by real things, real elements. The world had to be absolutely filled up so that you could walk, walk from one side to another and had to, of course, be equal. It's a democratization of the hierarchy. It is a flattening out of the picture. It is a non-hierarchical equivalent world, a world in which it is pretty hard to find your place in. Next, please. And that's what uh, Pascal, you know, Pascal, who wrote Pensees, the thoughts of Pascal, the philosopher, scientist, theologian. And I will read you what uh, Pascal said about Descartes, because Pascal comes slightly later. He's already very critical of Descartes' homogeneous world, which is continuous, which is filled up, where everything is space. Descartes says in fragment 205 of his thoughts, that when I considered the short duration of my life, swallowed up in the eternity, before and after, the little space which I fill, see, he's like a Cartesian, the little space which I fill, and even I can see it, engulfed in the infinite immensity of spaces of which I am ignorant and which know me not, I am frightened. And I am astonished at being here rather than there. For there is no reason why here rather than there. Why now rather than later? Who has put me here? By whose order and direction have this place and time been allotted to me? Then he goes on, fragment 206, the eternal silence of these infinite spaces frightens me. Well, I'll bring up the problem to Malevich, paintings 1915, 1912. Uh, Kierkegaard, the Danish, thinker said something very similar to Pascal, but listen to his tone of voice. He says, who am I? How came I here? What is this thing called the world? Why was I not consulted? How did I obtain an interest in this big enterprise they call reality? And if I'm compelled to take a part in it, where is the director? I should like to make a remark to him. You see, the problem, the tone has changed. It's the same Pascalian metaphysical loss, but it's, there is an impatience, unlike Pascal, unlike Rembrandt here on the left in his self-portrait. Rembrandt still could uh, think that if space was no longer the dignity of man, at least thought was the dignity. All our dignity consists in thought, Pascal. By it we must elevate ourselves and not by space, which we cannot fill. Let us endeavor then to think well. This is the principle of morality. Man is but a reed, a most feeble thing. He cannot fill space. He cannot fill space. I've often wondered, this is what uh, Rembrandt must have been thinking to himself when he painted the self-portrait. It's very enigmatic. It's the other side of his canvas, and not by coincidence is the other side of the canvas looking like a Malevich outer world. Not only its form, but its opacity. What is Rembrandt really painting? In what way is this a self-portrait? He's standing. He's looking at us, at the viewer, but he's showing us himself as a painter of what? 
of the other side the immensity of space which cannot be filled impossibility to fill the other side Malevich next please So the giving up of space, the giving up of filling of space, is also releasing of space. Heidegger talks about release of all places. Heidegger says, we are now in the process of releasing places to themselves, to their own oblivion. Steinberg's The Inspector has released the Midwest, the Midwest picture, and in it, are it's in it we have the engines of the melancholia of Durer in it we have the pieces that anatomical enigmatic mystery has been released and also in architecture in architecture on the left because it's from Ledoux one of those revolutionary architects dreamers opium eaters he draws his cemetery at show like this this is not a drawing of the world. This is drawing of the elevation of the cemetery at show. Well, it's another task now to fill the void which has opened up. And we know that we cannot fill it by our own being. There is no way this fragile and mortal corpus can match the disclosure or the depth of the disclosure. So the elevation acquires a new significance. It's not just elevation the way we use it, elevation in building. It's an elevation of architecture. Next, please. You see the center cannot hold. We are out of space and into something else, perhaps into another time and what does it mean to be out of space to run out of space to release places to themselves it really means this finally it's not by coincidence that we find it in cemeteries because cemeteries are like a show like the melancholy of Dur Durer which is a type of cemetery of the task is the final resting place of the problem as we can see it we can't go beyond mortality when we are implicated in it. Our longing for the immortal is always in the form of leaving behind a clue of a code which is undecipherable. Two gravestones designed by two people. You saw his painting on the right side just before. That's Malevich. Malevich's own design tombstone somewhere in the suburbs of Moscow. It's a little square within a square. Very thin picture. That's really how it comes to an end. And on the right is Adolf Loos's last sketch. Adolf Loos, the architect. We're all very interested in his buildings. and. But let's uh, look at Adolf Loos. Let's see uh, what uh, were his, what was his last advice, his dying words the dying words of perhaps one of the greatest figures in architecture. His dying words were in the corner scribbled there, how am I going to put my name on it? How am I going to inscribe my name on this particular cube? Next, please. And it is not only a social pathology, but clearly also a personal pathology. The fragmentation and dissection that has taken place in a work of an architect li like Lecure must have taken its toll. He, if you will, is both Ulysses and, and the dumb rower. See, there is no more labor to depend on. The chain has been cut. Nobody's going to do the work for anyone else. Everyone now has to be bound and, at the, uh, and deaf and at the same time hear the riddle. And that's the self-portrait of Jean-Jacques Lecue, the architect. That's the architect of this building. 
and he drew himself many portraits like this. It's not one, many different ones. He looked at himself and he looked at the architecture and the architecture is perhaps the first one which uses pieces of old architecture without too much caring about them, where they come from. It's his little meeting place at Bellevue, but the pieces come from everywhere. It's a very, very contemporary building. It's been put together, assembled in a very quick way, but there is a price to pay for it. Next, please. And this is the price. The price is that now one must take charge of the whole show. It's not enough just to dissect a few bodies, dissect a few objects. One must go move to the elevation and elevate oneself and reality through oneself. It's a deification of the architect. The becoming immortal, the trick of becoming immortal while remaining mortal, or the trick of seeking salvation while remaining alienated. And there are two of these eyes, but they are not the same. This one comes from 1533, Jean Cousin, the architect, who did a book on hieroglyphics, Horus Apollo, description of secrets of Egypt. And there is the secret of Egypt, it's the eye of God. So he drew the hieroglyphs in a contemporary manner of a French 16th century man. There's the eye, and he said, remember the eye of God. And there is Ledoux now drawing the theater at Besançon as a projection, reflection, if you will, at the same time of himself. He was clearly aware of Jean Cousin, he was clearly aware of Horus Apollo, he was clearly re aware of the taboo, but the secularization of culture had taken place, the, you can say, homo homogenization has taken place, and that's what it looks like. Next, please. The form is the same, the content is different. And one could write probably a whole book or a whole treatise on the figure in it all, like in the disaster of war, what happened to the figure? What happened through the domination, through the violence in architecture to the figure? What happened to, through technique to the content of experience? Well, this is what happened, even in a short time of 50 years or less. These figures are taken from the, on the left from the prisons of Piranesi, and look at them no matter how dehumanized their environment has become, no matter how severely punished they have been by the architecture, they are still exhibiting signs of sanity. They are still gesturing to each other across the chasm of space, across the vacuum which Pascal talked about, across the non-filled up space, gesturing to each other for help. See, that's what I think they are saying. If one would hear the shrieks in the prison as one has heard them already this century, not so long ago, one would hear those very words uttered, help me. But in Boulay, the problem has gone out, has evaporated in the same way that Orwell speaks of the Jonah. It has become insular, introverted, so introverted that we don't really believe that these participants in the library, National Library in Paris are reading any books. I mean, the whole place is just a vast encyclopedia, and these figures are automatons performing the role of Athenian scholars, but there is no conviction behind it. It is only a question of method. Next, please. No, I think there was another slide here to the left. It has three circles on it. That's it. It's upside down, but...
it's reversed that way. And the diagram on the left was made by a psychoanalyst, Kurt Levin, in a very brilliant study called The Image of the Past, in which he actually showed for us the evolution of the mind of John Locke. You know, John Locke wrote the Treatise on Human Understanding, Treatise on Government, one of the most important philosophers. According to hypothetical Binet Piaget Golton investigation. Now, this is what Kurt Levin says. He says, number one, when Locke was four to seven years old, his head was very heavy. It felt like the cave at Lascaux a primitive, you know, it was a very heavy skull. His body really had to work hard to support it. And inside this cave was Papa, Mama, Bow Wow, day and night with a question mark, perhaps. Pictures of this sort. sort. But now, when Locke grew up a little bit and he went to grammar school, his head turned into a mind. The Lascaux cave became a bit thinner. And inside of this not so heavy skull, contents was increased. See, because it was now bigger, thinner, but bigger. Pater, Mater, Magister, Euclid, Caesar, and so forth. Triangle, book, and these little figures. And then, Locke's mind, you see, from, from head on the shoulders to the mind and finally to the field of consciousness at the end. After the study of Newton's writings that Locke made, that's what his head looked like. It was abstract. It had a dotted line around it. And it was filled up with ideas, like with Newtonian particles. Consciousness, associations, all these words were floating in it. I think it's a very brilliant, a v brilliant uh, analysis because it really does describe uh, also what I'm trying to say. It describes what happens when the head sort of expands in size but shrinks in weight. And it's uh, not only illustrated by Boulay, who also studied Newton's writings, uh, literally. He also, I mean, this is how Newton's, uh, Boulay's, a project for Newton looks like. This is Newton's cenotaph for Newton. And the architecture has indeed lost its uh, even place in the, in the world, and it has become simply a field, a homogeneous field in which very different applications can be made, very different methods can be used on this field, and it's all in dotted lines, and it's all in this abstract, border. Next, please. Well, stay with me for a few more seconds because I'm coming to an end. Uh, I am uh, really talking about the fireworks, See, the fireworks of being, the fireworks of knowledge, the fireworks of architecture, the big light that they throw on onto the darkness uh, that we experience only momentarily at night. But uh, what does it mean, the, you know, shining the big light? Shining the big light means also sh casting very, very big shadows. And the bigger the light you have, this is what Diderot and the encyclopedists already understood, that the bigger the light you have, the more obscurity you create on the other side of the flashlight. That's an illustration from a 18th century uh, festival in Venice. And it's fantastic. They made a whole structure and an, a, a whole uh, architecture for the display of light, fireworks, pyrotechnia. There were many treatises written. Architects were involved in it. On some feast day, they would celebrate setting off Roman bombs, Roman candles, as they called them, and make a fantastic splash and illuminate San Marco as it has never been seen even during daylight. But if you will notice, just like that curious little figure who has been caught in this picture, I don't know by whom, there is a little line 
on the left of this engraving, you see it? It's coming from the Campanile down. And the description in this plate tells us that while the big lights, the big fireworks were going off, one guy was diving down head first into a shallow basin erected in the piazza. So while nobody was really looking, one acrobat, trickster, magician, who probably walked up this tightrope before the performance began, was sliding head first into the darkness. And it, I think it's very poignant, a very meaningful moment of description to realize that even in this big light, you have to remember at least one person has got to be a fool. Somebody has to go downwards on a rope, head first into a very, very shallow basin of water. Next, please. because we come with the 19th century to the end of the dream. See, the end of the dream is the end of the palace. It's the end of that kind of architecture that I spoke about earlier. And these are two ends of a dream. They each have their own logos. Each one seems to t have its own continuum post-mortem. On the right is uh, Crystal Palace by Paxton. You probably know this building well because it's illustrated in all histories as the first important modern building, mo very reasonable, mass-produced, and uh, nicely detailed. And on the left one is a building not so well detailed, not so mass-produced. It's a work of one man who was, if you will, just a postman. In France, it's the postman Cheval. Are you familiar with his work? He lived in this provincial town and uh, decided through revelation, he never had any education beyond primary school, that he would become an architect while remaining a postman. So he collected all his uh, rocks during his journey you know, for 20 miles every day to deliver letters with a wheelbarrow. And he collected these stones, and he brought them all to Hauter Reeves, the place in which it is built, still standing today. And he built this incredible palace with his own hands. And inside of it, he writes, I have built this place all by myself, and it is my palace, and it is the end of my dream. And this palace contains all the palaces that he ever dreamed about. You see, it has in it all the pictures, all the, uh, well, I'm sorry, I don't have more slides of it, but it's got everything. Indian architecture, Indonesian, Assyrian, Chinese, French provincial, chalets from Switzerland, everything is in it. Uh, but the curious thing about Cheval's palace is that it has no space inside, you see? It's as if he had forgotten, but he didn't. There is no place to be inside. It's just a tunnel. It's just a labyrinth with all these engraved poems. And finally, you get to the last one in the labyrinth, and it's the wheelbarrow and the trowel and the hammer and all the tools of the architect, naive architect, put into the building as an altarpiece, as the last altarpiece of architecture. And of course, we are taught that it's a pretty unreasonable, a pretty fantastic building, isn't it? It's so unreasonable, especially in the context of French 19th century culture. It was built in the l end of 19th century. But which one is really manifesting the reason? Which one is manifesting the unreason? You see, I think, personally, the unreason is Paxton. Because when it came, to stopping the dream, in Paxton's case, he couldn't stop it. He only said that, well, the length of it, you know, you know how long it is? It's 1,851 feet long, because that's the year it opened. I mean, what other, how, how long should it be? Can you make it, you know, does it, you know, is the problem of length really part and parcel of the problem of production or self-reproduction? Well, this is one of the last things I'm reading, so stick here. It's about the Crystal Palace from Dostoevsky, the Russian writer, from his notes from the underground. Mm -hmm. And notes from the underground are notes from that guy diving into the shallow pool of water, because Dostoevsky was certainly diving down, not up. And he says this in chapter 10 of Underground Experience. 
So you believe in an indestructible crystal palace in which you won't be able to stick out your tongue or blow raspberries even if you cover your mouth with your hand. Remember the tongue, see the le que tongue. Le que is still able to stick his tongue, but he didn't get any commissions except a little bit on the side. But Dostoevsky said, but I'm afraid of such a palace precisely because it's indestructible and precisely because I won't ever be allowed to stick my tongue out at it. See, try to understand. If instead of that palace, there was nothing but a chicken house, and if I had to crawl into it to get out of the rain, I wouldn't call it palace just out of gratitude because it kept me dry. You may laugh and say that for that purpose it makes no difference whether it is a chicken coop or a palace. I would agree with you if the only purpose of life was keeping from getting wet. But suppose I decided that keeping dry is not the only reason for living, and that while we are at it, we'd better try to live in a palace. That's my wish and my choice. You'll change it only when you, change, when you manage to change my preferences. By all means, do so if you can, but in the meantime, allow me to distinguish between the chicken coop and the palace. Now let us assume that the crystal palace is nothing but a pipe dream, that the laws of nature don't provide for it, that I dreamed it up in my stupidity, influenced by certain old irrational habits of thought that are common among my generation. Are you laughing again? Go ahead, laugh. But I still won't say that my belly is full when I'm hungry. I still won't content myself with a compromise, with an infinitely recurring zero, just because it is allowed to recur by some law, just because it is there. I don't accept as the crowning of my dreams a big building for the poor with apartments leased for 1,000 years and a dentist sign outside in case of emergency. Next, please. The fate of the end of the palace, on one hand, Cheval, the naive, the private palace, and on the other hand, the indestructible crystal palace. The one on the left is a picture I took at Hunts Point in, in the Bronx in New York. I was just passing with a car in this rough area of town. And I risked, really, I did risk my life for this picture because I couldn't figure it out. It was not a zoo. It certainly was not a prison. It was some house. I mean, it's a rough area and you have to live in it. You have to do your best. But that's what it looked like. It was just fantastic. It reminded me a lot of Cheval. It reminded me a lot of the process in which this other public, indestructible palace also was founded. And that's a Lenny Riefenstahl photograph, staged for the camera, staged for propaganda purposes. It never happened that way at the Nuremberg Zeppelin field, but it's a palace nevertheless. It's a vision of it going on and on and on and subordinating itself to the infinitely recurring zero. Next, please. To reflect to be conscious, it's the best I think one can do. At least for me, this would be already achieving tremendous lot. Like in the Romanesque chapels. This one is in Milstadt in Austria. We find these columns. We find the origin of the columns. We find this lonely, unbelievable icon of architecture buried, puzzled, transfixed, but nevertheless aware. But on the right, we have just a neat solution. So neat that it is the final one. And it's not a Hilbersheimer plan for the new city or one of those countless things that you can see wherever you travel or in books. 
it's the actual plan of Auschwitz concentration camp. That's what it looks like. Not too horrible. We could read it. We know the streets. We know the things. Everything is the same, except it has been distorted, taken one step further, reasoned one step further. And K2 and K3, K4, K5 are sort of centers of the community, but the demise of the community. These are the gas ovens. And I could go on and on. It's an incredible event because it happened in our time. It didn't happen a long time ago with some primitive and uneducated people. It happened by the very, in the very same climate, in the very same culture, which gave the greatest achievements of the Enlightenment. And it's too silly, I think, to dismiss it and say a quirk in the system, just a piece of bad luck. You can't say it anymore. And I often wonder for myself, what is one to do after this? See, you know, what, you know, is one to, how is one to behave after this has already happened? Because if one is tacit about it, if one simply collaborates by unconscious, one is nevertheless guilty of the same crime. And I'm talking now about the ideology which informs architecture, the entire ideology, not the proppings, not the duplicity of the front and the back, but the entire ingrained, pervasive dilemma that confronts us whether we like it or not. Next, please. Are we to forget? Are we to swallow it with sugar like a anesthetic? Well, I think the Walt Disney character is a profound character because it is a character, nevertheless, who doesn't think. If there is one thing characteristic about these cartoons, that they are mindless. You, know, you can laugh and you can, uh, you can laugh and you can uh, accept Mickey Mouse because it's funny through sentimentality. We can accept it, but if really the cartoons had a proper label on them, if the Walt Disney cartoons were called, there is nothing more, they would strike us as horrifying images of ourselves. There is nothing more. There is only the method. There is only the continual running, and there is only the character ingrained in it, but there is no distance from it. There is no consciousness. It is a vain, if you will, violence. And on the right is Robert Venturi's award-winning design for the showroom. And to me, it is equally profound, equally portentous. It is like that. We can take it that there is nothing else, that it is a consummation of the situation. We accept it as a piece of behavior. And even if the architect accepts it with irony, those people who are in it won't. Next, please. And there are two more, one from architecture, one from art. On the left is Francis Bacon, who, I don't know, 1972, 1973, was voted the most popular, most significant painter in Europe. And he had a few years ago just a big exhibition in America in the Metropolitan, in which I, I was there and I walked through countless rooms, which had these amazing figures, which reminded me of Mickey Mouse not just on the formal level of the isolation of the figure through distortion against the background, the separation between the background and the figure, the cage and the element, the fact that he can paint the cigarettes perfectly precisely but the face in distortion, the fact that the shoes are recognizable but not the chest. But I think the, fr the Bacon has really, I wouldn't say expressed, but described for us without the sentimentality but equally mindlessly what Walt Disney has described to us. Just in the same way that Professor Kira at Cornell University described to us architecture as a problem of defecation, a 
problem of shooting. And it's a not some crank or minor, you know, this is a, stu a three, four million dollar study years ago, about the same time that Bacon was very popular in Europe, commissioned by Cornell University uh, and approved by the highest echelons of the Endow National Art Commission, National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities and Sciences. And we have, I think, here two images, not by coincidence, are these viscera, not by coincidence, these are uh, Jonah-like, modern Jonah-like images. And in both of them, I think, we have even further than in the Venturi and Mickey Mouse, not the title that nothing is hap going to happen anymore, but that the worst has already happened, and that it is time now to get the worst into focus. And I think this is the problem of Mr. Kira, Professor Kira, and the problem of Francis Bacon. It is how to focus on the worst, and it is very difficult. You know, Francis uh, Bacon said that he would like to paint gritting of teeth the way Monet painted a sunset. And he's got a problem because he paints it, and if you walk through the exhibition, and as you walk through Mr. Kira's studies of the bathroom and the position of, of the organs, you realize that everything has already been accepted not merely the conformism and the alienated behaviorism, which it all implies, like in uh, Bacon's paintings, it's not about the anguish of modern man, it's not about the loss of soul, it's not like the Vesalius diagrams, it's just a very cold, factual description of mutilated violence. And I think that in both cases we have a problem of alienation as a human type, human logos, and an alienation which seeks its own form. You see, truth sought its own form, dream sought its own, for, its own form, alienation also seeks its proper form. In a way, all the forms of alienation that I've shown in 19th century were the improper or unfulfilled forms of alienation. What we have in Professor Kira, in Walt Disney, in uh, Francis Bacon, in Venturi's work, we have the alienation provoking its absolute form, which is the form of the non-reflective, or I should say it more properly, the form of the mindless. So it's a mindlessness is the absolute form of alienation. Next, please. You see, like Galileo, Francis Bacon, and all those behavioral positive attitudes to architecture seek a description and not an expression of meaning. And in both Bacon and Kira, we find really the problem of something like an unhappy ape. See, the, the so-called user of the bathroom is already an unhappy ape, and so is the one who is sitting for the portrait. Inability to think. Aldo Rossi, school at Fagano, one of the most, I think, remarkable buildings, contemporary buildings, because it does give glimmers of, of the absolute form. The longing for it is gone. We don't have the longing so much, we have the actual description of the absolute form. As we have it here in a 1905, uh, first socially funded, one of the first socially funded community centers in Sweden. 1905, this is what it looked like. They attempted, you see there's a man in the back peering out, and each one of these are homeless beings, children, and each one within this Blake-like interior occupies a cell, a cell with all the trappings of reality as if it was a center of some community. Each one has their own room, and each one hangs a different picture and a different character. But altogether, we must remember at the end, the gentleman who's peering out, well, the gentleman is absent in the school at Fagano. It's hard now to reconcile it because of the absoluteness of the proposition. 
Next, please. So we are talking also not about mindlessness, but also about idealization of pain. The form of ideal pain. John Haydock, uh, another remarkable project, I think, for me, the 13 Towers of Canareggio, in which 13 people are selected by the town as prisoners. And you would say, well, at least they are alone. But they're not alone. They are just like the figure in Bacon. They are just like the figure in Kira. They are not alone because they are observed. You see, it is not aloneness, but it is an isolation under, without privacy, under laboratory conditions. And of course, in Venice, in this project, there is another tower in which everything is reflected. And anyone can go up to that tower to watch what happens, happens to the 13 inhabitants who stay here for life, and then 13 others move in. I don't think it's just a fairy tale. I don't think it's just imagination at work and architecture. I think it's real important. And I think it goes back probably to what are the first signs of architecture in our world, 20,000, 30,000 BC. Mary Koenig of Saarbrücken in Germany, who is perhaps the leading expert in this field, has shown that this figure is the first figure of orientation, the oldest thing cut into a rock. And it consists of four lines scratched on a stone with a pattern of dots which are overrunning it. And her interpretation is very interesting. She, she says that the four sticks are the four directions which have not come together yet. See, they are the directions that will finally intersect around 10,000 BC into a axial system of some sort. But these have not yet come together. It's, the world is open transversally or longitudinally, so to speak. But the openness is foreclosed by these dots. And the dots are the knockings of a hammer. They are ritual knockings of a hammer. And she says it's a very simple knocking. It's knocking to let someone be aware that they are there drawing the lines themselves. So there is the two things. There is the indirected directions, not yet cohering. And there is the knocking to let someone know that a problem has been born. Next, please. In architecture. And um, coming to an end, it's, I cut this out from the New York Times very recently. It's IBM display in China, in Peking. IBM uh, is going to put telephones now in China. And this is the first glimpses of progress. And the left is Carl Jung. Yes, the writer, psycho psychologist, who wrote all those beautiful books on alchemy and the unconscious, in his own tower at Bollingen. And I illustrate here progress and regress. One is illustration of progress, and one is a regress. One is a progressive regression, and one is regressive progress. Jung was living in this tower in Bollingen for many years. That's where the, all the books came from. And I would like to tell you from his last book what he said about this tower. He said, there is nothing in my tower that has not grown into its own form over the decades. Nothing with which I am not linked. Here everything has its history, and mine, here is space for the spaceless kingdom of the world and the psyche's hinterland. I have done without a bathroom, without electricity, and tend the fireplace and stove by myself. 
evenings I light the old lamps, there is no running water, and I pump the water from the well. I chop the food and I cook the food. I chop the wood and I cook the food. These simple acts make me simple. And how difficult it is. We no longer live, live on what we have had, but on promises. No longer in the light of present day, but in the darkness of the future, which we expect will at last bring the proper sunrise we refuse to recognize that everything better is purchased at the price of something worse. That, for example, the hope of greater freedom is canceled out by increased enslavement to the state, not to speak of the terrible perils to which the most brilliant discoveries of science expose us. The less we understand of what our fathers and forefathers sought, the less we understand ourselves, and thus we help with all our might to rob the individual of his roots and his guiding instincts, so that he becomes a particle in the mass ruled only by what Nietzsche called the spirit of gravity. Reforms by advances, that is by new methods or new gadgets, are of course impressive at first. But in the long run, they are dubious, and in any case, dearly paid for. They by no means increase the contentment or happiness of people on the whole. Mostly they are deceptive sweetenings of existence, like speedier communications, which unpleasantly accelerates the tempo of life and leaves us with less time than ever before. In the tower at Bollingen, it is as if one lived in many centuries simultaneously. The place will outlive me, and its location and style points backwards to the things of long ago. There is very little about it to suggest the present. If a man of the 16th century were to move into the house, only the kerosene lamp and the matches would be new to him. Otherwise, he would know his way about without difficulty. There is nothing to disturb the dead, neither electric li light nor telephone. Moreover, my ancestors' souls are sustained by the atmosphere of the house, since I answer for them the questions that